Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation with Adam Sowards about his new book, Making America's Public Lands, which synthesizes public lands history from the beginning of the Republic to recent controversies. Joining the author in conversation will be journalist and author Michelle Nyhaus. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs on our YouTube channel. On Thursday, April 28th at 1 p.m., Mark Updegrove offers an illuminating account of John F. Kennedy's brief but transformative tenure in the White House in his new biography, Incomparable Grace. And on Wednesday, May 4th at 1 p.m., Tamiko Brown Nagan will discuss her new book, Civil Rights Queen, which tells the story of Constance Baker Motley, the first black woman to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court. Two years ago, as the COVID-19 pandemic closed down businesses and schools, people across the nation turned to parks and other open spaces. In urban parks and sprawling national parks, we sought places where we could socially distance and let nature lessen the stress of the day. We enjoy our public lands, but often take them for granted. Learning how they came about and how they have been used over time enriches our overall understanding of them. Here at the National Archives, we preserve the records of the four federal agencies most involved in the management of our nation's public lands, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. The written records, photographs, and motion pictures contain the stories of the beginnings of federal stewardship. In his book, Making America's Public Lands, Adam Sowards takes us through the history of these lands and examines the changing priorities and challenges concerning them. Adam M. Sowards is professor of history at the University of Idaho. He's the author of United States West Coast and Environmental History, The Environmental Justice, William O. Douglas, and American Conservation, and An Open Pit Visible from the Moon. Michelle Nyhaus is project editor at The Atlantic, where she edits features for the Planet section in a series called Life Up Close. Her writing has appeared in publications, including the National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine, and she's the author of Beloved Beasts, Fighting for Life in an Age of Extinction. Now let's hear from Adam Sowards and Michelle Nyhaus. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm Michelle Nyhaus, and I'm here with Adam Sowards um, to talk about his wonderful new book, uh, Making America's Public Lands. If you are tuning in today, uh, it's, you're, it's likely that you've spent at least some time in what Adam calls the public's lands, uh, our national parks, wildlife refuges, national forests, or any one of the other landscapes that make up our public land system. And Adam's history, one of the many things I appreciate about, appreciate about Adam's book is that it's both very nuanced, uh, but also wonderfully accessible. And it is, in addition, very alert to the role of the public lands today, not only as uh, valuable conservation lands, but as a source of some very deep rooted um, myths and concepts and traditions in our in our national politics, not only our environmental politics, but our national politics. So Adam Adam begins the book in a way you you might not expect. He invokes uh, both. Henry David Thoreau and uh, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt. And I know if I it were possible to eavesdrop on a conversation between those two human beings, I would give up a lot in order to do so. Uh, Adam invokes Thoreau uh, because Thoreau had a very prescient idea that that forests could be held in in common for the public good. And then he invokes Hannah Arendt's idea, her metaphor of a table as a place, as as a metaphor for the, the public sphere, um, a table being a place where citizens can gather and and find something approaching common ground. And I think Adam will start with a short reading from the introduction that elaborates on that second metaphor. Thank you, Michelle. 
This will be a fairly short reading. This table metaphor works to guide us through the history of American public lands. And it helps us think about the public lands as part of the democratic experiment that is the United States. It takes no great leap of insight to find faults and failures in meeting the promises of democracy for the nation is rooted in the dispossession of indigenous land and the enslavement of Africans. The history of public lands include democratic shortcomings and exclusions, just like every other part of US political history. That is partly why thinking about public lands as an element in the democratic experiment is helpful because we can see who defined the nation's land and for what purposes, how new ideas supplanted old ones and how novel understandings complicated traditional views. With the lands themselves as the common object that focuses people's attention, we learn that this quintessentially American system, like the nation itself, is full of experiments, successes and failures, and promises made, broken, and redefined. Throughout this history, the table and those gathered around it changed and multiplied, guided by evolving laws and science, not to mention shifting political interests. Like a growing family at a holiday dinner incorporating new entrees, the more interests at the table, the more cacophonous and unfamiliar it appeared to those who had been gathering there for generations. This book is an account of how the table changed, which is to say it is a history and not a philosophical treatise or a polemic. The book attempts to explain how the system came to be and why as well as how and why it changed over time. The consequences of this system on the land itself and for the people who relied on it for whatever purpose remain central to the account that follows. It draws special attention to where constraints and boundaries were redrawn and new political and legal traditions initiated. These moments of transition draw attention to novel arrangements of power and to the land. Frequently, if not always, they were contested, demonstrating that these lands and the processes that governed them mattered to Americans who relied on them. Such disagreements are inevitable and healthy in a democracy when participants were allowed to be involved. This involvement has not always been the case with some participants directly excluded and some merely perceived their exclusion at other times. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for setting the cacophonous table for us. <laughs> so one of the great things about this book, um, you have studied the history of public lands for a long time. I have reported on public land politics for a long time as a journalist. We both know that this history is, is very complicated with countless characters, and it's also very long. Um, it's prehistory is, is as long or longer than it's, than it's written history. Um, but you've managed to fit a lot of complexity into a graceful volume that is, let me make sure I get it in the screen, that is just a little over 200 pages. So um, I know also from experience, having just written a, a history of the conservation movement, that, that writing efficiently and, and writing short is much more difficult than, than writing long. How did you find a path through the history of public lands that, that managed to capture nuance as well as um, as well as tell the story at a, at a manageable length. Well, thank you uh, for saying those kind words about the book. I'm glad that it reads that way to you. Um, as you know, uh, when you tackle a big project, you can't use every example in every story that you uncover. Um, and I think about the book a little bit like a key that it unlocks the larger history so that if you're reading it and it doesn't include your favorite park or your favorite forest or the rangeland that's in your state that you go to, um, you'll be able to read it and understand the larger context in which those things uh, exist. One thing I try to do in the book that um, I don't know that it's unique, but I tried to write it of the systems at large. Many writers and historians have taken on a single park or taken on the forest service. 
And what I tried to, or, and then there are some that look at all of the public lands. Um, but when you look at those, many of them are organized. Here's a section on the park service and here's a section on the Bureau of Land Management. And I wanted to try to see if I could tell it as a history in more of a stream of time. So looking for uh, trends that cross all the agencies in the same sort of decades. And um, maybe that allowed me to um, use examples that tied multiple things together um, and where if I had gone bit by bit, agency by agency, park by park, um, I would have, it would have been a much, much longer book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can see that. I, I think that you, you brought out some themes that, that were maybe not new to me, but I hadn't quite grappled with directly. They were, they were so big that I couldn't see them because I was down in the weeds of, of individual agencies or individual places. So I, I found those, those big themes to be especially uh, fascinating. Now, you make clear that the history of the public lands doesn't, of course, begin with the founding of the Forest Service, doesn't begin with the signing of the Constitution. As I mentioned, the prehistory of the public lands is is longer than the written history of the public lands. Where, where does the history of the public lands truly begin? That's a great question. Um, and as with so many things, uh, sadly, in American history, I think the history of the public lands begins with the dispossession of indigenous people um, who lived on this continent since time immemorial, uh, the, the forces of colonization that depopulated much of the continent and, and changed the political, military, economic dynamics here, uh, sets the stage for all that comes after. Um, and so it's that, uh, it's that clash of col uh, colonization that I think really helps uh, precipitate what leads to um, this public land system that we see emerging a little bit later. And I, I do wanna to return to that later in our discussion because that history is of course still very much with us and and there are some um there are are some some modern responses to it that i think are, are very interesting and sources of hope for all of us um but let me move forward in in time a little bit um in the context of that dispossession um there was a very interesting and complementary role played by uh, founding fathers Jefferson and Madison. And I actually wasn't aware of, of Madison's role in uh, it, which his, his vision was mostly ignored, I should say, but, but his, his uh, it was influential in, in the, in the formation of the public lands. Can you say a little bit about the, the their complementary visions and, and their effect on the public yeah. land system? I'd be glad to. Um, it's the, the effect is somewhat indirect, but um, mm -hmm. Jefferson is sometimes been called the agrarian philosopher and sort of famously sees uh, virtue um, embedded in farming and the practices of, of that sort of labor in the land. Um, and that in part explains why he was enthusiastic to uh, gain the Louisiana Purchase to increase the size of the nation, uh, expecting that independent yeoman farmers could move and move west. Um, of course, this land is this is a process of dispossession that's happening um, with that westward movement, and independently with their labor, transform the raw earth as they imagined it into uh, good productive labor or good productive products um, that we might sell and, and have sustenance for. Um, the challenge with this is that there's a lot of land in North America and it became very easy to just sort of, uh, to mix my metaphors here, cut and run um, as, as you would imagine in a forest. Um, and Madison, along with others in the early part of the Republic thought there's a need to slow down and there's a need to improve our land and not use it so extensively. So stay rather than move and treat the land better and more sustainably, um, which uh, was in some ways an anti-slavery uh, position as well, an idea not to keep moving west and moving the, expand the, the slave system west too. Um, of course, there's so many paradoxes, like we could spend the rest of the hour talking about them for both of these men um, who, who did not so much live their ideals <laughs> as write about them. No. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop with, with that. 
Yes, I, both were slave owners, we should acknowledge. Um, mm -hmm. That, so, and and so really for a long time, the, the vision, the the vision that led to the public lands was was a commercial vision. I mean, conservation didn't come in um, until much later. Later, and and it's interesting to me the, what comes out very clearly in your book is that it was a commercial vision, very divorced from the reality of the land itself and the the reality of the the Western climate. Um, and and the the public land system, I. I I think it could be said that that in a very broad sense, it is it resulted from a collision between this this Jeffersonian vision of an agrarian republic and then the the harsh reality of of the Western climate. Can you tell us tell us what happened when those two visions uh, met or those yeah. two realities met? Yeah. So uh, even before the Constitution was signed, um, the the system that was in place was that all land held in common by the by the state. Um, the ultimate goal was for that to become privately owned, and um, the government under the Articles of Confederation and then under the Constitution uh, developed various means to get that land into private hands. Um, the most famous example, of course, is the Homestead Act of the 1860s, but there were predecessors to that. And that worked reasonably well, 160 acres, you could make a, a self-sufficient farm in lots of places like that. But as more uh, white farmers moved to the West, they found that 160 acres was way too little or way too much. So it was too dry. Um, or also too mountainous. That was an also a, 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 something that was uh, the Homestead Act was not sustainable for. And so Congress tried out adapting these laws. They said, gosh, well, if you plant some trees, you can have more land. Or if you bring irrigation, you can have more land. And these just kept not working. And um, 160 acres on a steep slope in the Rocky Mountains isn't going to lead you to a very uh, self-sufficient sort of livelihood. And right. many places in the West were too high or too cold uh, to to have really a, an agricultural uh, economy as these founders had expected. No and matter so, how many trees you plant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so in the 1870s and 1880s and sort of increasing in that era, you have a number of people saying, well, we need to do things differently. And some of that was uh, maybe the land needed to be, the land given away, taken away would need to be smaller and mm -hmm. would bring irrigation and manage a smaller amount of land. Or maybe it needed to be bigger. You would need a lot of acreage to run cattle in um, different parts of say Colorado as an example. So we can make some adjustments there. And within those conversations, one of the ideas that emerges is maybe these big mountain ranges with all these trees shouldn't be owned by individuals because 160 mm -hmm. acres of trees is not gonna last very long. So maybe they should be controlled by the federal government. So these eyes start, or these ideas start percolating in the 1860s, 1870s, but Congress moves slowly even then. Um, and it took a while before uh, Congress decided that in 1891 that the president could have the right to reserve some of those lands so that they would not be cut. They would not be owned by individual people or companies, but they would be kept uh, in trust uh, by the federal government. And then that evolves in a variety of different ways around that turn of the 20th century Great. into and what we think of as conservation. Yeah. And I mean, and just to emphasize these these lands uh, that that couldn't be homesteaded were still being exploited both by individual landowners and by corporations who saw them as, oh well, you know, free trees <laughs> or free pasture. Um, right. Tell us a little bit about what was happening, uh, just what was happening on the landscape. Right. So before these um, measures go into effect. Um, it's it's free and open for whoever can get to it. And there are large herds of cattle or sheep that are moving up the mountains. And sometimes they're competing with the other cattle and sheep uh, operators in the in the valley. Um, and so that led to pretty bad overgrazing in lots of cases. There's a lot of concern about timber being stolen from these federal lands as well. When the 
first forest reserves, as they were initially called, were created, there were relatively few regulations. And so then the concern was about timber trespass, people stealing. Um, and I guess to back up one bit of context is there's a great fear at this time in American life that we're going to run out of trees and we're going to run out of lumber. This is the age of wood and mm -hmm. which provided fuel as well as building material. And uh, timber corporations had denuded the upper Midwest very, very quickly in the last part of the 19th century. And there's a great concern that that can't be allowed to happen um, in the Sierras, in the Cascades, in the Rockies, or we wouldn't have enough wood to fuel our nation and their nation's economy. Um, so that is sort of creates some of the urgency around this. Mm -hmm. But to use any of that wood or to use any of that pasture, no one paid anything. So they're taking from the public lands, valuable resources and turning a profit from it. Um, and that's uh, also part of the concern that develops around these conservationists who wanna institute some reforms as we move into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So this was in part, this; these were people who were, were in a sense echoing Madison's warning about soil, you know, we're going to use up the soil, they were saying, we're going to use up these trees, this, these were, you know, uh, early conservation sentiments, but there was also a commercial interest here, the federal government is, is, is losing money by giving away, or passively giving away these resources. Right. Um, so the federal government's assertion of control over the public's lands uh, did create enormous bitterness. I know I've read some stories about what it was like to be an early, one of the first forest rangers um, and to, to ride into town <laughs> as a representative of this newly created forest service and be confronted by a bunch of unhappy ranchers who for the first time were going to have to pay grazing fees or were going to have to manage their cattle in certain ways. Um, and generations later, I know from from reporting and, and living in the rural West, it's not unusual to hear um, the federal government's presence in the West, um, and I'm sure in other parts of the country as well, referred to as as a land grab. So set the record straight for us. I know it's it it uh, wasn't a land grab, but what was it? <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't a land grab. I'll have to think about what it was. Um, <laughs> as so, there's the, the vast. Um, unclaimed um, once the land had been dispossessed by native from native peoples those all the unclaimed land was part of what was known as the public domain and as territories utah wyoming idaho whatever as they be entered into the union almost everyone there's just a couple exceptions explicitly uh, gave up claim to all of those public domain lands um, that those are the federal governments so you'll often hear in um, well, throughout the 20th century and the 21st century, talking about the, the state should get their land back. Um, it was never theirs to have, so it couldn't, have been, couldn't be taken back. And when the Forest Service is probably the best example of this, when it is finally created in 1905, so just a quick note, you can reserve forests in 1891, but there's no uh, agency in charge of them until 1905. Um, so there's a little gap there in, in how things are gonna be managed. Um, real quickly, some, I would say, fairly light regulations get imposed and some very, fairly small grazing fees get imposed. Um, but if you're a rancher who had grown accustomed over a decade or two decades or three decades of running cattle and not paying anything, um, those grazing fees seemed um, like they were taking money from you, they were taking uh, your rights away. So there was a great deal of controversy around that um, and a desire to push back against it. Uh, Supreme Court by 1911 said, absolutely, the Forest Service has the right to do that and to administer these sorts of fees. Um, in many places, I think the record shows that the initial creation of these sorts of places generated a lot of resentment and a lot of uncertainty. And then in a little bit of time, it became okay mm -hmm. that, say, 
the fact that the Forest Service was going to help put out fires made it an okay thing for them to be around now. Mm -hmm. And many of the restrictions were in the larger context of all the changes happening in the first part of the 20th 20th century, not that big a deal. And so uh, there's a settling in process, I think, where locals get accustomed to um, what these public land agencies are doing, because quite frankly, they're not doing a lot. They're doing more than what had existed before, but not real restrictive measures quite yet. Mm -hmm. So the agency, as the agency settles into its place at your, at your metaphorical table, um, the people who are already sitting at the table or who had, had sat themselves at the table uh, get used to their presence. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. And, and there, so it wasn't just the, the conflicts did continue. There was acceptance of the, the presence of the Forest Service, but, but of course, arguments continued between the agency and between land users, users. And there were also arguments among, between land users themselves, right? I think people may have heard of the conflicts between the uh, cattle ranchers and the, the, sh the sheep grazers, uh, which, which actually got quite, um, well, they're, they're, they're legendary in a negative sense in the region. Can you tell me a little bit about why, why that was so passionately fought? Yeah, it's, that's a real complicated story, and it depends on the location where you are. A part of it has to do with scarce resources. Um, mm -hmm. when, uh, when the forage declines and there are a lot of animals trying to eat, um, that scarcity generates uh, conflict. Um, if you are a pastoralist and you have animals, you move them and you move mm -hmm. them across land. Um, and so that system of it's called transhumans is not uh, doesn't work super well with private property. And that could generate some challenges as well. Mm -hmm. The labor that ran many of these animals across the mountain ranges and across valleys in Wyoming or in the southwest um, were not always white. And that could be associated with mm -hmm. uh, conflict as well um, and associations uh, regarding who is a legitimate uh, home builder, which was a, a term that was used often um, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so many of those sorts of uh, uh, um, economic conflicts start, sort of emerge. And there's also the conflict between someone who runs thousands of cattle and someone that's just got a small little homestead is just trying to make it work. And those bigger, uh -huh. more powerful political economic interests can really run what you might call the little guy out. Um, and, and there were, in fact, um, there was violence. Um, people yeah. were killed um, over these sorts of issues. Um, they're not divorced from the land. They're not divorced from larger political questions. They're not divorced from cultural preferences and um, mm -hmm. issues like that either. Yeah, you sometimes hear them referred to as the cattle and sheep wars, and uh, they yes. might not have been on the scale that we usually think of as wars, but they did, as you say, uh, sometimes result in violence. And But that's that's a good point. It's not simply a conflict between two ways of, of using the public's lands, but it's an economic, perhaps racial and cultural conflict mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Um, so a as this is happening, as as the the uh, I suppose we can call them customary users of the public land are are grappling with the the presence of a newly created federal agency. There is also in the nation as a whole. There's a growing interest in conservation. We've mentioned this briefly, but but how was that affecting uh, the the work of these agencies, and how is it affecting what was happening? to the landscape itself? That's a good, great question. Um, and there's lots of elements of conservation. And um, so for example, uh, one element that is involved is recreation. So we want to protect beautiful places that people could visit and enjoy um, as a tourist. And that this, this comes to be seen as uh, you know, America's equivalent of visiting the Alps, for example, <laughs> um, in Europe. So we want to protect these these unusual, usually they're unusual landscapes. So the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, and these get protected because 
um, it, it would be a place to recreate um, and really recreate ourselves and to, to think about ourselves as Americans, as something distinct in the world. So that's that's one element of this. So that's that's different at this point from let's protect the trees from getting all cut down. Mm -hmm. um, there are other elements of the conservation movement that are interested in making sure there's water to be either irrigated or to, 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 to go to cities. And that relates very closely to the national forests, which are almost always, the early ones are almost always in urban watersheds. Um, we don't normally think about it this way, but that's what many of those first national forests are all about is to protect the watershed of Seattle or mm -hmm. the watershed of what becomes Phoenix. Um, and so these things start to work together, um, I think, at this time as well. Um, there are other concerns about, say, wildlife, which you know more about than I do, of course, um, where certain animals are, 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 are either going extinct or very nearly so. And there's um, the, the, the necessity to protect some habitat where these animals might be able to survive or to have places where they wouldn't be hunted. This was a sort of simplistic notion that it was just hunting and if we could stop hunting, mm -hmm. all the animals would come back. Um, but that was how uh, uh, managers were starting to think about this in the early part of the 20th century or to create more of this type of wildlife and less of that type of wildlife. So there would be predator control the campaigns to get rid of sure. all the wolves or to reduce the coyotes and so that we can have the animal that we want. Um, so there, what's starting to emerge in that early part of the 20th century and really intensifies as we move toward the middle of it is um, lots of management, lots of fingers trying to get into these systems and tinker with them to make them, well, this is the place where we can have tourism. And this is the place where we have this sort of animal. And this is, we'll get rid of that other kind of animal that, that might cause a problem there. Mm -hmm. And we'll manage these forests for water, but also for timber later down the road. So um, there's long-term thinking, um, but there's also a sort of a narrow range of options that are in the imagination of the people that are starting to do all the tinkering. Hmm. Yeah, that that's it's such an interesting point. It, just as someone who's thought who's thought a lot about the rise of the conservation movement, there are all these all these different threads that are that are you know working on separate fronts to a large extent. You know, the sportsmen who are trying to protect the animals they love to hunt the um, urban reformers who wanted clean water in the cities, um, people who were trying to protect scenic landscapes and people who, you know, recognized that or were starting to recognize the ecological importance of forests and wanted to protect them for that reason. They were, as I said, they were all fighting on, on separate fronts, but they all converged in a sense on the public lands. Um, and they, yeah, they were all uh, either sitting at the table or, or trying to get a seat at the table. Um, and then, as you say, the, the managers themselves who had kind of tentatively sat down and said, oh, don't worry about us. We're just going to charge modest grazing fees and perhaps limit, you know, the number of cattle that you run on the public lands and perhaps prevent timber poaching. Uh, we're now going to have a much expanded, you know, move over. <laughs> we're going to take up a much, much more uh, space at this table and we're going to get much more involved in, in what happens on the landscape. So that brings us into um, a, a era that I know you've you've thought a lot about in particular, the, the 50s through the 70s, you've identified as, a, as an especially important chapter in the public lands. And this is something that was fairly new to me as well. So so what was we have the we have the conservation movement, we have a pretty now professionalized um, system of land managers uh and then we have continued use of the public lands and perhaps multiplying uses of the public lands. so how how did that uh cacophonous conversation unfold in the, the 50s through the 70s yeah that's great um a quick preface uh, that's i think important uh, in the 1930s there's a great depression of course and one of the most popular programs of fdr's new deal was the civilian conservation corps and so public land agencies had at sort of their availability a bunch of unemployed men to do projects so trails got built and roads got built and fire lookouts got built and 
phone wires got strung between these places in the back country. And um, that helped sort of set the stage for what happens after World War II, because so much had, had been built during the 1930s because of these programs. Okay. And so and, when and you there move- was, sorry, just to interrupt you there, but sure. just th- there was an economic stimulus uh, purpose to that, not only to employ people, but to, to stimulate tourism, correct? Um, right. In, on yeah. the public lands that, that wasn't. Yeah. They uh, built the people campgrounds who were, and yeah. yeah, all sorts of things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So this, so that infrastructure, if you will, is created then during that 1930s or expands what had been there before. And as we move into world, the post-World War II era, on the one hand, we have a big chunk of American society that has pent up demand to have fun and they've got some money. Um, we have uh, surplus from the military so people start rafting like they hadn't before and you have gear to go backpacking and there are all these new trails and the infrastructure to get to these places so there's on the public side there's this large and growing group of people who want to experience the outdoors want to experience the public lands and um, they're going to scenic places and seeing just magnificent landscapes, uh, unquestionably magnificent. And just you can't argue with that. At the same time, some of the land managers are trying to uh, trying to manage. They're trying. They're getting involved, um, and they're intensifying their management of these places. And they're intensifying everything. They're intensifying recreational use. They're intensifying how they're going to manage the forage, the grasses that the animals are going to eat. They're intensifying how they're going to manage the forests themselves. Um, And at the same time, um, part of that consumer demand that I mentioned just a moment ago included building a lot of new houses. And a lot of private timberlands had been, um, if not entirely exhausted before World War II, they had been cut over pretty good. And so at this point in the post-World War II era, they looked to the public forests as a source of lumber. And so timber sales on national forests increased dramatically. So a bunch of stuff is happening here. There is intensifying management in the national parks, in the national forests, on the Bureau of Land Management lands. Heck, they're even intensifying their management of ducks. We want to have more ducks that we can hunt on the wild, wildlife refuges. So there's lots of like, we're going to, so it's not just managing, it's we're going to maximize the use of these places mm-hmm. and of the use of these resources. And at the same time, all these Americans are going out and they're driving their big cars into the national parks, or they're going camp in the national forest, and they're starting to see stuff. They're starting to see overgrazed rangelands. They're starting to see some clear cuts and they're starting to think maybe, maybe, maybe the forest service is doing too much. Maybe the park service has built too many visitor centers. So um, emerging in the 1950s then, and I haven't even mentioned the dams that are being put in every stream that is possible, uh, it seems like at this time, um, there is an emergent wilderness movement where there's a desire to protect places from commercial development, more or less uh, entirely. And that coalesces in the 1950s and pushes toward what becomes the Wilderness Act, which passes in 1964. And that's not the very first law in this era, but between 1964 and say 1976, a whole handful or a couple handfuls actually of laws pass Congress overwhelmingly bipartisan, just some of them unanimous um, in the House or the Senate. Right, the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act, Wilderness Act had four votes against it. I mean, just it's overwhelming bipartisanship Mm -hmm. at this time to vastly change what happens on the public lands and what some of the purposes are. And not only that, so the wilderness is a different purpose that gets really uh, codified for the first time through Congress. But the other thing that emerges during this era that is so important is the processes of management change. So that when changes to wilderness areas or when a a timber sale is going to go up, 
there will now be, beginning in the 1970s, a place for the public to not only object, but just to weigh in. And the Forest Service would have to say, we're planning a timber sale, here are the options for the uh, proposals that we have. And the public could uh, have a lawsuit. Um, this created opportunities for that. And so to get back to the table metaphor, <laughs> all of a sudden, there's a lot more people sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. There are people there who are gonna represent salmon. And there are people there who are gonna represent rafters. And there are people there who are gonna say, we shouldn't be cutting trees in this place for these purposes. And so if you're someone that sat at the table when there were only 10 people, and now there are 20, you have less power. And that becomes concerning. You used to, people used to listen to you and now you have to wait longer to speak and you're not the only voice. And so that really changes how this system has been functioning. Right, and what used to look like a full table is starting to look a little thin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as people all reach out uh, to get what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe this is a good time to to take a breath and and just look back at how far we've come at, during our discussion in the last few minutes. I'm I'm just struck by the the contrast between um, what was happening just a century earlier. The the federal government had these lands that that were al almost in some senses a, a burden to the federal government. They couldn't give them away because they were not suitable for homesteading. Um, they had some per commercial value, but but really they were they were kind of, you know, unwanted lands. And then and now, you know, as we're the period we're discussing in the 70s, these lands are expected to, you know, provide timber, provide clean water, provide pasture, um, provide, you know, um, water it, through reservoirs, um, and then provide all sorts of recreation, motorized and non-motorized, and then <laughs> provide all the values that we attribute to capital W wilderness, the legal definition of wilderness. Um, this is just a huge, it's a huge shift in our perception of, of these, of these lands and, and what we expect from them. Absolutely. And I mean, if, within the career of one person in one of those agencies, they would have seen just a radical change in what was being asked of them. And I think mm -hmm. that that's an important way to think about it. Like if you're a young person born in say the year the Forest Service was created in 1905 and you start working uh, for the Forest Service when you're 25 in 1930 and you spend 30 or 40 years in that Forest Service, it's gonna look pretty radically different by the time that you retire. Right. The, I mean, the landscape probably looks very different. And then, and the processes, as you're saying, you know, all of a sudden there's a, there where you used to, as a, as a forest ranger, you might've gone out and talked with a few people about what was going to happen next year on the forest. You now have a, a formal system of, of public consultations that are participated in by people from all over the country. There are a number of federal laws um that that need to be considered as you're as you're planning for the forest and you know these were all these are all what we consider today great conservation victories uh but they certainly changed the conversation about the public lands in in quite significant ways absolutely yeah, yeah. so so this uh, and you talk about how this this in a lot of ways um this shall we say, crowding of the table. <laughs> I don't mean to make it sound negative. This this um, this inclusion of more people at the table without necessarily making the table bigger, uh, that led to, that in, in some ways led into the political polarization that we saw during the Reagan years. Can you talk a little bit about the connection there? And, and I'm interested in the polarization, not just in environmental politics, which you and I are both familiar with, but, but in, to some extent, the public lands started to become um, started to play a, a significant role in national politics. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, part of it is again about sharing power, which I've already mentioned. But um, in 1979, the Assembly of Nevada declared that the public lands within Nevada were theirs, and that the Congress never had the right to take them. 
Um, and that really starts what we call the sagebrush rebellion. Um, and we've seen various forms of it sort of pop up uh, every every half decade or so since it seems like. Um, and when Ronald Reagan did run for president um, in 1980, the first time he declared, I'm a count me in as a rebel. He was That's trying right. to associate himself with the sagebrush rebellion because it it what it does at this time is it's one more representation of the federal government and federal overreach and too much but like all of our problems or most of our problems are being caused by government from from that perspective in the 1980s um, and if you look back the previous couple of decades you do see uh, increased responsibilities for the federal lands but also a variety of other things that are being done in american society at this time and as I was speaking of in the last uh, few minutes, it's a bewildering change to a whole lot of people. And one way to resist change is to say, well, let's go back to the way things were um, and mm -hmm. not have it, or let's go back to the way we imagine things were. Exactly. Um, and right. um, we'll, states will take over. Now states, you know, most state lands uh, are required by statute to maximize resource potential. And that's not consistent with the Wilderness Act and other such things. So calls by Western states to return the land to the states was a way of saying, we wanna have more control. We want Washington DC to have less control. Um, and what the ramifications of that might be, um, I guess we never found out because most of those things did not actually go into effect. And one of the things that did go into effect is that ramped up the environmental movement. So what, one of the things you see happening in the 1980s is a shifting radicalism from the environmental side and a shifting radicalism from the anti-conservation side, if you will. Um, neither label is exactly correct, but mm -hmm. I think you get my sense here. And so there's spectacles that both sides participate in. Um, there's protests that both sides participate in, civil disobedience that both sides participate in. Um, and over the next 40 years, I guess, um, those things wax and wane, violence is involved. Um, as we move into the 1990s, um, the day after the Oklahoma City bombing, a local forest uh, office was, was told, um, if you come take my cattle, you're gonna be greeted with, with um, 100 men with guns, um, which is yeah. something that we saw again in the 21st century as well. So yes. um, this is an accelerating trend that happens out of a reaction to those changes that uh, that happened in the middle part of the 20th century. Yeah. And and as you say, just to 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 emphasize that point, there there is a perhaps on, on on both sides, there's a nostalgia for a past that never quite was uh, because the public lands were never envisioned. The public land system was never envisioned as as a place that was purely to protect land undisturbed and it was never envisioned as a purely commercial enterprise um, there was always an element of sustainability um, from the beginning um, and there was always an element of of commercialism Isn't yeah that, i think that that's right that's correct yeah i think yeah. that that's true yeah and, and there was never a time where everyone was getting along and getting exactly what they wanted <laughs> yes <laughs> Sure. Right. Yes. Um, there were, but there were times when people um, perhaps were had more of a voice because other people were being left out, and right. that that Absolutely. is a, a real change, um, though perhaps not not quite the the change that uh, perhaps the 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 way it's characterized by people doesn't often acknowledge that that the reason why they felt like they had more why they had more of a voice was because other people didn't have a voice. Yeah. Um, and now, of course, the, the polarization we're talking about does continue today. Um, I, you know, I remember quite clearly when I was a, a itinerant uh, wildlife field researcher in the mid 1990s, uh, hearing some of these conflicts over the management of endangered species on public lands that got quite heated um, and you know violent, as you say, with with threats and and, and actual violence um, toward. Uh, 
Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management um, employees. And, um, and that has continued some of the same people, in fact, or the descendants of some of the same people have continued that kind of rhetoric um, into, into the modern era. So um, perhaps you could, you could talk a little bit about what we've, what we've seen just in the past few years and, and how, and the, the connection you see back to the origins of the public land system. Yeah, so there have been anti-conservationists um, from the beginning of, the, the, of these public lands being reserved and retained by the federal government. And uh, I think that they're, again, they sort of pop up during different times. Um, there was a big movement right after World War II. There was a, a hope that a bunch of the land could be uh, returned returned again to the states. Um, and most people, most of the critics of that movement said this isn't about that. It's about not supporting the conservation movement at all. And so it was under trying to undermine that with the idea, less of an idea of sustainability and more maximization of, of private profit um, to make it easier. Um, and the, the polarization that we're all living through if we're adults, um, we've seen this and we see it play out on, on conservation um, uh, issues where uh, wildlife refuges are taken over by protesters or wilderness study areas are uh, have roads carved into them to try to prevent them from becoming wilderness areas. Um, and so uh, it, <laughs> It, it, I think one, one set of radicalism leads to another set of radicalism and these things sort of ratchet up. And the, I think the antidote to that is hard work. It's sitting down at the table and, and like, I sort of imagine this table most of the time in this book being round where we can <laughs> all sit at this round table and we can see each other. We're, we're mm -hmm. all in a different position and all have different values, but we can all see each other. But as we move into this, the, the period closest to us, it feels much more like a long skinny table where we can't see everybody anymore. And we just continue to face off rather than share. And I think that that's one of the challenges because I think the so one of the solutions is a lot of hard work getting to know what you want, what I want, where we might be able to compromise and collaborate. And there are examples of this in a variety of, of locations, but there's not a lot of examples of it. And it's mm -hmm. time consuming and it's costly. And the conservation challenges that we're faced with are expensive and they're interconnected because these lands are connected with one agencies and another agencies plus private lands. So all of this is, it takes so much time and so many resources and it's a lot easier to just yell at each other. <laughs> right. I, I like that. I like that metaphor of the, or I don't like it, but it's a, it's a very appropriate metaphor of a, a long table where we can't quite see each other um, or can't see each other fully and, and are just, um, I often feel that way when I report on these kinds of conflicts that people are just, you know, standing up and, and uh, pontificating from, from a great distance to the other people who have a stake in these public lands and there's very little listening going on. But as you say, there are some examples of perhaps, you know, these, these round tables still exist uh, at the local and regional level. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. So maybe you could leave us with some, uh, some inspiration because I know some of these stories, um, especially that involve uh, indigenous led conservation are, are very heartening and, and, and are examples of things that, that, we could follow in the future. Yeah, um, there aren't, we don't know these stories well enough yet, I think. Um, but I know that there are in the, in the American Southwest, there've been examples for decades now um, of, uh, of environmentalists working with traditional land users to figure out better ways. Um, there's the High Desert Partnership, I believe is what it's called in Eastern yeah. Oregon, worked really hard to, because this is in the same neighborhood where the now here wildlife refuge was um, taken over in 2016. Um, in, um, in the 1990s, tensions there were really, really at a high point and 
kind of not, you know, hot and violent. And there was a, a, a determination in this community to like, let's solve this and make it, you know, less, less tense. And there's been some research done that suggested the reason that the wildlife refuge takeover didn't have a greater local effect is because there had been long hours of neighbors getting to know neighbors and trying to solve these sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. And I look to things like the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition that come together to try to protect Bears Ears in Southern Utah um, and eventually get it turned into a national monument where they will be co-managers with the federal government involved in this. And this feels like some sort of whole circle, something happening here where uh, we have indigenous people reaching out and being part of this rather than being left out deliberately or having land taken deliberately. Um, so I'm hopeful where that might go um, um, as, as it moves forward and develops their management plans there. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we started this conversation talking about the, that the, the history of public lands is rooted in dispossession. And right. a story like Bears Ears gives me hope that uh, there is there certainly that that history can't be reversed or and can't be made up for but that there is a way forward from it um and and the high desert partnership i mean we should say for those of you who don't remember the malheur um national wildlife refuge takeover was a was an armed takeover by by uh extremists uh anti-government extremists um and it lasted 40 days and i think that as you say, the reason why the community was not was not um, more supportive of the ideals of these these interlopers was that, un, unbeknownst to these extremists who were from out of state, that the local people and and local public land managers had done decades of work to to find their places at the table and to have a conversation with one another. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think we can we can all take heart that those those conversations are not easy, but they are are possible. Exactly. Um, I know you wanted to end with just a very short reading, um, and I think that that reflects the spirit of what we're just sure. we're just talking about. So sure. You can take this us out the, with that. The last paragraph in the book, um, and I just get done talking about some people coming to tables to find common ground. <laughs> I say this point is not meant to suggest that using and governing public lands in the future will be, can be, or should be easy. It never has been. The work of living within environmental constraints is among world history's most complicated and important tasks. And the exercise of democracy in a diverse and complicated society like the United States challenges citizens and their elected decision makers to set aside narrow interests and seek a broader public interest. To make matters even harder, the 21st century includes global problems of climate change, biodiversity crashes, and political corruption. Moving toward the future, public lands can and should play a central role in combating these compounding crises. Recall Terry Tempest Williams' words quoted in the book's introduction, the integrity of our public lands depends on the integrity of our public process within the open space of democracy. Promoting and maintaining that integrity demands an honest reckoning with history, a past that includes the exploitation of people and the land, as well as the protection of places and democracy. Robin Wall Kimmerer stated, the very land on which we stand is our foundation and can be a source of shared identity and common cause. The task before us then is to ensure that our common forests, parks, rangelands, and refuges scattered across the nation function as the public's land and not the preserve of one group or another, for that undermines the promise of a democratic and ecological citizenship that might bind the nation together. One way we might begin to repair the earth and our politics is with the public lands.
Thank you so much, Adam, and thanks for this conversation today. Um, it's great to hear your insights. Again, Adam's book is called Making America's Public Lands, and it's out now. I hope you'll all pick it up and read it. It's it's really full of um, full of just very thoughtful commentary on these on the on a very complicated story that that affects all of our lives um, and affects some landscapes that I know all of us love. So thank you for joining us today. And I hope you'll join the next event at the National Archives. Take care, Adam. Thanks, Michelle.